Kia Robert McLaughlin here, lecture three of week seven, continuing our study of linear systems, and today we will actually solve them. And it turns out to be extremely uh, simple conceptually. There is a bit of uh, uh, arithmetic to work out the solution, but the method of solving them could not be simpler. And it works for any system of this type, any large system, in first order constant coefficient linear equations. And the idea is to look for solutions where each component of that vector is an exponential. Now that's not uh, too difficult to guess where that came from. That's because that worked when we did the second order linear constant coefficient equations. But the slightly surprising thing is we're going to look for solutions where every component is the same exponential function of t. So this is going to look like, as a vector, it's going to look like e to the lambda t times the first component of k e to the lambda t times the second component of k, e to the lambda t times the nth component of k. So they're exponential functions, but they'll all have the same uh, exponential constant. So let's try this solution and substitute it in and see what we get. So dx dt, well differentiating is going to be easy because I chose it to have the same e to the lambda t in each term. It's just going to be lambda e to the lambda t times this vector k. And that must be equal to ax. Well, ax is e to the lambda t times a times k, pulling the scalar factor e to the lambda t out in front. So here's my equation I have to solve. And I notice that comparing the, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, they're both vectors of length n. But the time dependence is very simple. It's e to the lambda t in both of them. So every one of those vector equations has a common factor e to the lambda t, which can be cancelled out. So I get lambda k equals a k. And I'm going to write it like this. So that's an equation. If I could solve that equation for the unknowns lambda and the unknown vector k, I would have found a solution of my differential equation. Now that is the eigenvector equation. So all the stuff you learned in 160-102 algebra is going to come into play here. You can find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. You can solve any differential equation of this type. Now how does that work? Just remember you move the right hand side to the left. And you write that in the form a minus lambda i times k equals zero where i is the identity matrix. That means if a matrix times a vector is zero and k is non-zero, well, of, of course I want k to be non-zero because otherwise my solution would be zero, which I knew was a solution already. So this means lambda is an eigenvalue of a and k is its eigenvector. Now, if a matrix times a vector has, has a non-zero solution, AX, AK equals zero has a non-zero solution K, that matrix must be singular. Its determinant must be zero. Which means I've eliminated the vector K, and now I need to evaluate the determinant of A minus lambda I and solve for it equal to zero. This is called the eigenvalue equation. Now, you would have learned in algebra that every n by n matrix has n eigenvalues, but it may not have n linearly dependent eigenvectors. Some matrices do, and some matrices don't. And just like that was important when we were solving linear systems, it's going to turn out to be important now as well. So combining this with uh, the principle of linear superposition, which says I can multiply solutions by constants, I can add them together. And if I have uh, in linearly independent solutions, then I get the general solution. My conclusion is 
if matrix A has n linearly independent eigenvectors k1 up to kn with eigenvalues lambda 1 up to lambda n respectively then if this holds then the general solution of the differential equation is x is equal to c1 e to the lambda 1 t k1 plus dot 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 plus cn e to the lambda n t k n. So the eigenvalues of a matrix turn out to be very important in terms of the physical interpretation of the solution because they tell you whether that solution is growing. If lambda 1 is a positive number, that's going to be growing in time. If lambda 1 is a negative number, the solution is going to be decaying to 0. So the lambdas tell you whether the solutions are growing or decaying, and we'll see later on that the complex eigenvalues are solutions that oscillate in time, or like sines and cosines. And the k's tell you the direction of that solution. Now when you add up all these vectors that are all pointing in different directions and are all growing or decaying at different rates, then of course the whole solution could be quite complicated. But conceptually, this is pretty nice. Now, not all matrices do have n linearly independent eigenvectors. If they don't, you could still form the linear combination and get some solutions, but you just wouldn't get all of them. So how can you tell if a matrix has n linearly independent eigenvalues? Well, one case is easy. Um, a has n distinct eigenvalues. That means they're all different numbers. None are repeated. And later on we'll see what, to happen, what will happen if some of the eigenvalues are repeated and we can solve the equation in that case too. It just gets a little bit more complicated. But this is the nice case where all the eigenvalues of A are different numbers. Then I get the general solution. So let us, let us do an example. We'll just do the 2 by 2 case, that's a bit easier. Here it is written as a matrix times a vector. So I just need to let A be this matrix. And to solve the equation, to solve the differential equation, I need to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. So here we go. First I need to form the determinant of A minus lambda I. It's going to be the determinant of 2 minus lambda, 3 minus lambda. You just subtract lambda off the diagonal. Leave the rest of the matrix alone. Determinant of a 2 by 2 is the 1, 1 entry times the 2, 2 entry minus the other two entries, 1 times 2. So this is lambda squared minus 5 lambda plus 4. And I'm going to be setting this equal to 0 and solving for lambda. So I can factor it. That is lambda minus 1, lambda minus 4. And this is equal to 0 when lambda equals 1 and 4. So the, de the determinant of an n by n matrix with the minus lambdas on the diagonal there is going to be a polynomial of degree n. It will always have n roots. Those are the eigenvalues. Now, it may be a little bit tricky doing the algebra to solve for solve the, the find the roots of this polynomial, but that's a separate problem. So, next step for each eigenvalue, I have to go away and do a separate calculation to find its eigenvector. So let's do them one at a time. Let's do lambda equals one. I need to solve a minus one times i times k is equal to zero. Now the matrix A minus lambda I, you, I've already written down up here. 
I just refer back to it and substitute lambda equals 1, and I get 1, 2, 1, 2, times k equals 0. Two equations and two unknowns. If you write out those two equations, I get k1 plus 2k2 equals 0 in the first row, and k1 plus 2k2 equals 0 in the second row. Two equations and two unknowns. But you notice that the second equation is redundant. It's the same as the first equation. I could just ignore it. And this will always happen. The second, Because I've chosen a lambda to be an eigenvalue, that matrix is always going to be non-invertible, which means when you row reduce it, you will always end up with a zero row, and I can will always be able to just uh, ignore that second row. So I can t I don't need the general solution. I just need one solution. So I'm going to choose k2 equals one. Substitute into the first equation. I get k1 is negative two k2. It's negative two. So my first eigenvector is negative 2, 1. Now I need to repeat that whole thing for the second eigenvalue, which is 4. And I need to not uh, forget what my matrix is. So now to lambda equals 4, a minus lambda i is equal to, subtract 4 off the diagonal, I get negative 2, 2, 1, negative 1. Again, notice that the second row is a multiple of the first row, it's negative a half times the first row. So I only have one equation to deal with, it's negative 2k1 plus 2k2 equals 0. I can choose any value I like for k2, so I'll choose it to be 1. Therefore, k1 is equal to k2 is equal to 1. So my second eigenvector is uh, 1, 1. And I'm done. So the, even if I'm doing it by hand, the total work to solve a 2x2 two two system is really not much. 3x3 three three gets a little bit more complicated, and that's probably the limit of what you would want to do by hand. So I know the general solution. is x is equal to... My first eigenvalue was 1, so I have e to the t times my eigenvector, which was negative 2, 1. And any amount of that one, and any amount of my second one, which is uh, lambda was 4. So all the solutions of this equation are growing very rapidly in time. 1, 1. And I could write that out as components if I wanted as well. Negative 2 c1 e to the t plus c2 e to the 4 t. Second component, c1 e to the t plus c2 e to the 4 t. 6, 1, 6, 2. And again, these will be some curve, this will be for each different value of c1 and c2, I get a curve in the plane. x1 and x2 are moving around in the plane as a function of t. So that shows you how it works for the case when the eigenvalues are all distinct. We'll do another example later for a 3x3, three three, and you can, you can probably guess what's coming now. Then we're going to look at the other cases, complex eigenvalues and repeated eigenvalues.